Ambassador Jimenez, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, all who follow us on live stream, uh, it's great to have so many people in this hall for uh, an important discussion. Uh, we invited you uh, to two years of the Russian war in, in Ukraine, to the question, what is at stake and what's ahead? Uh, I'm happy that we are not alone as a diplomatic academy in organizing this, but we are followed by the Ukrainian-Austrian Association as a partner and by the uh, Center for Strategic Analysis. Uh, both of, the, of, the, of those who, who run this institution are also with us. Uh, why did we invite you? I think it's obvious that uh, we have a situation uh, in Europe which is not bearable. Uh, I don't have to mention here at the introduction uh, the catastrophic effects of this war in the last two years. You know it all from media. Uh, but what we need to discuss uh, is the question, first of all, where do we stand now? What about our commitment uh, in this uh, conflict? How much is the support also on our European side crumbling or not crumbling? What is at stake? Are we discussing uh, a war against a country, a European country? Is it a colonial war? I think it is a colonial war that Russia is leading there. Uh, and secondly, what does it mean for the free democratic Europe? These are not easy questions to answer, and you know that also in the Austrian public you hear different opinions about what the situation is and what we should do. Um, this is what we're going to discuss uh, tonight, and we thought best to invite experts uh, from the different fields uh, to explain the situation and possibly also to help us a little bit understand the narratives that we are living in. As you know, nowadays the narratives are more important than the facts very often. That is the reason why I'm also happy that we have a book presentation included uh, in this uh, in, in this evening. Uh, and, and secondly, it's not only the narratives, it's also the question, how do we get out of this war? How do we get out of this war? Uh, and uh, you know that Austria, the government, and actually uh, the majority of the Austrian population uh, is supporting the Ukraine, but also is saying now, even our, our federal chancellor said uh, just a day or two days ago, Putin muss an den Verhandlungstisch. We have to fo force Mr. Putin to the negotiation table. Uh, do we agree that this is the, 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 the right time uh, to find a way out of this military conflict? So a lot of questions on the table. Uh, and I think after what happened in the last two years, uh, it is high time uh, to take stock and to talk about the way forward. Uh, the introduction is only an introduction uh, and not giving you the opinion of the director of this academy, with the exception that I think this is a colonial war. But it is also something where uh, I speak in, in, on behalf of our students, our staff, and our faculty uh, to support Ukraine uh, in defending their sovereignty and their territorial integrity. So I wish us all an interesting evening where we can exchange opinions on, uh, on where we are in this situation. Uh, and let me say also how maybe even better we may support Ukraine in this justified attempt to defend their people. And I say also defending Europe. So welcome to all of you, and I invite Ambassador Jimenez also for opening words. Dear Mr. Ambassador Briggs, Shanona Pani Stavro, dear Professor Müller, dear Mr. Prime Minister Heger, Dear Mr. Goethe, dear Mr. Feichtinger, dear ladies and gentlemen, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, Shanovni Pani Panova. 
I'm pleased to be here today at this discussion about the future of Ukraine. Two years ago, on this day, few people outside of Ukraine believed in the future of our country, which became a victim of full-scale Russian aggression. As a Ukrainian, as a human being, it was extremely painful for me to understand that my country was attacked, that people are forced to pack their most important things into one backpack and run to, their, to save their lives, that innocent people are being killed. As an ambassador, it was even more painful for me to see the hopeless eyes of many of my partners here in Austria. They didn't say it clearly, but they implied that we had no chance. One of my colleagues, an Ukrainian ambassador in a U European country, when he asked for help, was told that Ukraine had only a few days left to exist. This estimate of Ukrainians ability to fight back was wrong. But this is exactly the estimate that Russia wanted to impose here in Europe. Now, more and more people realize that Ukraine definitely has a future. And the future of Europe, if not whole democratic world, depends on this future of Ukraine. We live in the digital age. Access to information has transformed almost all areas of our lives. These are outstanding opportunities for education, science, and indeed everything, including diplomacy. These enormous benefits for humanity are being misused by Russia. Because Russia considers the information space as a better field. Besides the Soviet tools like manipulative statements, threats from senior officials or bribing journalists, Russia has ex expanded its arsenal in this field to weaponize technology for its imperial and horrific goals. These include fake news gener uh, generators and troll factories that use arti uh, artificial intelligence to produce content on uh, industrial basis every second to scare and to distort, to create and impose their own alternative reality. This is a reality in which murder, torture, abuse, and rape are part of everyday life. This is a reality in which the rule of power prevails, not the rule of international law. It is painful to admit. But Russia still seems to be successful. And the example above only confirmed it. If this is not counted, Russia will definitely succeed. And I am glad that Mrs. Stavros' piece has been published here in Austria. The importance of this book for German-speaking readers lies in the clear chronicle of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. This book exposes the fake Russian narratives used <coughs> by the Putin regime to justify the reckless, illegal, brutal war that Russia is currently conducting. 
And this book can be the basis for creating a solid picture of the nature of Russian aggression. In part, the book un uncovers Russia's chauvinistic and imperialistic nature. Today is it Ukraine. If it is not stopped in Ukraine, who knows where exactly it will be tomorrow. Russian aggression in the digital age, like it or not, affects everyone. The popular wisdom, everyone has their own truth, has become the basic weapon of this war. No matter who you are, two things are important to remember. You have to be able to fight for peace. You should not be afraid. Second, a person's action or lack of action are the same in terms of contribution to this war. So, to summarize, firstly, I thank Oksana Stavro and all those who supported her in the preparing of this piece. The city of Vienna, Theodor Kramer Gesellschaft, the University of Vienna represented here by Professor Wolfgang Müller and Michael Moser, the Diplomatic Academy personally to Mr. Ambassador Briggs, Alfred Braus, Katja Schneeberger, Andrei Jaworski, and Dietmar Pichler. Secondly, I thank each and every one of you who took the time to come here today and open your minds to better understand Ukraine. I ask you to make good use of this evening. Tell your friends and people you know about this evening and also this book. Write about it on social media. The book provides answers to many questions that some people may not feel comfortable to ask. I would like to conclude by repeating the words of my minister, Metro Kuleba, said back uh, in 2018. You are in a war for reality, but everything will be fine if you fight. End of quote. We have no right to be afraid. This is exactly what Russia wants. The Russian, the Russian regime can be defeated, including hybrid warfare dimension, especially with the help of United International Partners. Ukrainians have been brewing it. I wish you a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador, uh, for reminding us of what is at stake at this very moment. Uh, we decided that, because we have such a rich panel here, that we will, first of all, try the stock-taking. Try to discuss what is at stake at this moment, the different positions that we have, and in the second round, statements about what's ahead. How can we improve the situation, or what is expected by our experts. Uh, and uh, uh, we decided also to uh, to do it in a way that we start from the top of the political side, the European Union, the member countries of the European Union, uh, and that's why I would ask Eduard Heger uh, to be our, 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 our first speaker on, on the panel, uh, maybe also because we just had a summit in Paris, uh, and uh, you all know that the French president ventured forward saying one should never 
take any option out in situation of a war. And he was heavily criticized for that. Uh, but actually what he said was, I think, he said what we all said, the European member countries, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. But this is a very strong word, whatever it takes. Uh, and Mr. Heger, uh, you have a background as be having been the prime minister for Slovakia, finance minister also, but also in, in background as an academic. Uh, how do you see the situation at this moment? Well, thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your uh, introduction words. Very, very strong and uh, very important to listen. Uh, what I think when we ask the question, what is at stake, and if we want to be really honest to ourselves, I think it's our future as a free and democratic world. That's what's at stake. Why am I saying that? Because we're facing Vladimir Putin. And the more and more we discuss this whole Russian aggression at Ukraine, and the more we listen to Vladimir Putin, he says that he has planned this since 2000, his first essay and the steps he was doing. And we were just not, we were not paying enough attention to it when he went step by step. And even when he took Crimea, we weren't paying enough attention. We felt like um, it's something local. No, he's following his strategy. And if you listen to him, he has this idea of history where he interprets the history from his perspective, and he sees that the way the world is divided now, that's not the right division. That shouldn't be accepted. And that's why he wants to kind of revert the history and go back and renew the old empire. So that's why I think if we think of it and if we listen carefully, we have to be, uh, we have, we have to be aware that our future as free democratic world is at stake. And what it means, that means that our values are at stake, our security is at stake, and our freedom, uh, sorry, our prosperity is at stake. And I'm saying that as a Slovak, a neighboring country, who feels what it means, what kind of difference it is, if Ukraine, as a direct neighbor, will be free and democratic country, or if there is going to be Russian tanks at our border. We know, we experienced in the communist regime what it means, a strong border where you have military units at the border. I'm from Bratislava. I remember the Iron Curtain. There, weren't, there were parts in Bratislava you could not enter because it was military zone, guarded with dogs, electricity, whatever you can imagine. So definitely, I don't want this path anymore on any of the border of Slovakia, nor on the east. And it goes with the security, but it goes with the prosperity. We here in Vienna, and you in Austria, know what was the prosperity of the, of the countryside outside Vienna toward uh, northeast. There was no prosperity, because it was closed border. Open borders brings prosperity. Why European is, uh, is so prosperous? Because there is open borders, free, um, uh, free motion of goods and of people. So that's why it's so important to fight for Ukraine and the good where we, where we see that the Ukrainians are actually fighting it for us. They're fighting for our values. They are willing to share their own blood for these values, uh, freedom and security and prosperity for us. Because it's going to be a big difference for the whole Europe, not just for Slovakia or Poland or Baltic countries, for the whole Europe if Ukraine will not remain free and democratic country. And we see that Vladimir Putin, he actually attacked the democracy, the democratic regimes. That's the battle. He says, me as an authoritarian, I am showing the whole world that this is a better regime. Why Mr. Lavrov started very soon or very immediately, I would say, after they started the invasion, traveled the whole world, Africa, Latin America, etc., and trying to explain the way they see the, the conflict. Because they saw 141 countries were in, uh, against them. And they realized, OK, we have to win the hearts of the people around the world to show them that our regime is better. So this is the battle that we are fighting. And I'm very glad that the Central Eastern Europe, who have strong experience with Soviet, U Soviet Union and the totalitarian regime, 
were very loud at the beginning of this conflict to speak to the German, oh, sorry, to the Western, to the Western leaders and explain them how we feel at the European Council. I experienced it every month. It was not just about data, it was also about the experience that we had with the totalitarian regime that we see present now in, in, uh, in Russia. So that's why I, the unity was very strong, the strongest ever in EU. Even COVID wasn't as united, the countries weren't as united as they were during uh, this uh, Russian invasion. And it brought that we were able to introduce many uh, sanction packages. But now, somehow, we, the debate started to be about, okay, well, it's too long. It's taking too long. Do you listen? I mean, do you understand? What do you mean it's taking too long? We're fighting for our future. It's not the matter of time. It's the matter of achievements. We should not measure it in time. Of course, nobody c could even imagine <coughs> that in 21st century there will be such a, such a war uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. So, so that's why we have to understand that there is decision-making level, which is the leaders, the prime ministers and presidents, and then there's the public. And in Slovakia, we sp experienced it very strongly, strong Russian propaganda, disinformation flow, very, very strong. I don't know what's the situation in Austria, but in Slovakia, it was tremendous. We couldn't really deal with the flow of the disinformation coming uh, to Slovakia, and it was starting to change the atmosphere in the country. That's why we have a change in the government, and that's why the gov government, unfortunately, is now uh, joined uh, Hungary, and there is two prime ministers. There was one, now it's two prime ministers who speak basically the Putin's messages. But still we see the rest of the leaders on one side, strongly united, which is very important. So Putin is fighting on both battles. One, he's flooding all the environment, the public, with disinformation. And the other, he's trying to undermine, through the public, the strength of the governments. That's his strategy. Plus, he's fighting the war in Ukraine. He is full-scale hybrid warfare with Ukraine, but actually with the democracies. So we have to understand this level. That's why I'm so glad that uh, Emmanuel Macron, but also Peter Fiala, the Czech Prime Minister, he called for a coalition, okay, let's get together, let's put the money together, and let's uh, increase the capacity of production of the bullets for, or, and the shells for, uh, for Ukrainian that they are asking for. Nobody is pushing Ukrainians to fight. They are fighting for themselves because they see it's a, it's a vital need that they're fulfilling, and, and they're showing the boldness. We in Europe, we are still kind of balancing between the courage and the fear. We are fear of Vladimir Putin, that he will, uh, we will escalate, we will make him angry, etc., etc. Well, one last thing I say, and then I pass the, the, the word to the next levels, I would say, is that we have to realize that this fight or this war is not only about uh, current situation and current time. It's also a message that we leave here for the history, for our children, for our grandchildren, to show them how to deal with dictators in the world whenever they attack democracies. Because if they see that they get by, as, they, as he did in Crimea, he will follow. We don't know when and where, but he himself says he's not finished. So that's why I think it's so important to realize and be so smart and strategic and look at this, what is at stake. This is not about how far will the front line in Ukraine move. This is not at all. There is much more things uh, at stake. So that's why I'm so glad that Emmanuel Macron, a French president, it's not Eastern or Central Europe, those we have experienced, but the West now said, okay, we have to do more. We have to do more. Let's gather together and let's see who can contribute with what, because what we did now, it wasn't enough. They're in need, they're bleeding, and are we helping them or not? Because I remember Slovakia, or the, the Slovak people during the Second World War, we were in need in 1944, and we're calling to our allies to help us, and they came no matter what. So, so this is the history that showed us how to deal with the 
with people who went crazy and thought that they can own the whole world. So we have to follow this history for the, our children and grandchildren. And that's why it's so important that the, the political leaders have support of their people in helping the one that is in need. And that we speak, as it was mentioned by you at, uh, in your speech, speak to your friends, speak to those people who are misled by the disinformation that they understand and they go into the depth. That's very important. Thank you. Thank you. From this uh, high level, we go now to Oksana Stavroy, who wants to speak to people. One of the ways is by having written this book, which was mentioned by the ambassador. Oksana Stavroy is uh, Ukrainian and Austrian, educated in Ukraine and in Austria. Uh, she is a journalist, a writer, uh, and did uh, legal studies also in Austria, uh, and uh, I would ask you to give us your point of view, what is at stake at this moment? Thank you, Ambassador Briggs. Uh, thank you also, Ambassador Jimenez, for, for the introduction of the book. Uh, so uh, I don't need uh, to speak anymore, I think, but I, I try. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I met here in Vienna a woman from, from Ukraine, a refugee. Uh, she comes from Mariupol. Uh, this woman is a sewer. She makes um, costumes for dancers, for dance competitions, you know, uh, cha-cha-cha, rumba, tango, all glitter and glamour. She told me her story. Her house was destroyed by Russian shelling. So she had to live in the basement with her senile mother. In her neighborhoods, uh, some of her neighbors were killed in the attacks and had to be buried in the backyards of their apartment buildings. After two months or so of the uh, Russian occupation, she managed to escape the city. She's basically a typical represent, a representative of uh, so-called uh, Russian population of the Eastern Ukraine. She spoke all her life Russian, um, her relatives live in Russia, and her brother moved to um, Russia from Mariupol uh, just one year before the full-scale um, invasion. Uh, first, she wanted to stay in contact with him. She told him about what is going on. Um, the, Russian, the Russians are bombing, they are killing us. But his reaction was uh, even more traumatizing than the violent attacks. Um, and he answered what uh, Ambassador Jimenez already uh, mentioned. He answered just, um, no, 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 it, it's not like that. It's different. You have your truth, we have our truth. Now my new acquaintance uh, doesn't speak uh, with her brother anymore. She calls her brother and Russian soldiers and other Russians zombies. She says um, they are all zombies. They don't know the facts, and they don't want to know the facts. They have lost touch with real life. They are mentally dead. This is exactly what my book, uh, Russia's War about, um, uh, Against Ukraine, Facts and Perspectives, is about. Uh, no, not about zombies, but about facts and about words, too. Um, because words form our perception of the reality, influence our decisions, and therefore our actions. Facts matter, and words matter. The Russia, Russia's war against Ukraine demonstrates this again and again. The Russian President Putin based the Russian claim to Ukraine and to the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, on the so-called 
historical ties between Russia and the Kievan Rus. But Russia and the medieval state of the Kievan Rus existing from uh, 9th to the uh, 13th century with the capital in Kiev have more, no more in common uh, than, let's say, uh, Austria and oysters. Russia used to be a Tsardom of Moscow, which renamed itself the Tsardom of Russia, or Russian Empire, only in the 18th century. And the city of Moscow itself was founded as a colony by the Prince of Kiev, Yuri Dolgoruki, in the 12th century. Thus, uh, 700 years uh, later that the foundation of the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, had taken place. The facts uh, don't deter Russia from the claim uh, that modern Russia, Belarus, uh, whose territories were under the rule of Kiev and Rus as well, and Ukraine are the brother nations, and Russia is the more senior of these brothers. Uh, at this point, we are not going to discuss this notion of brotherhood, uh, which uh, is, uh, seems to entitle one brother to dominate and invade the others. Another allegation is still cruder. Russian politicians are justifying the full-blown Russian invasion of the neighbor state by the existence of Nazi and Banda raids in Ukraine. At the same time, several Russian explicit neo-Nazi groups are fighting on the Russian side against Ukraine, while in Ukraine, the right-wing parties have not even received 5% of the vote in the elections um, for more than 10 years. The Russian press and politicians are using the words denazification, debanderization, de Europeanization, de Ukrainization, uh, in order to describe the extinction of the Ukrainian state and the Ukrainian nation as such. This is an example of the Russian totalitarian newspeak, uh, the language manipulation aimed at perverting our perception of reality, at hiding the facts. Other examples are um, of, of this Russian you speak, uh, the invasion of Russian fighters under the command of Russian citizens, financed by the Russian Federation, equipped with weapons from Russia, but with participation of local collaborators in Donetsk and Luhansk regions since uh, 2014, is called civil war. The large-scale war against Ukraine is called special military operation. Kidnapping and deportation of thousands of Ukrainian kids to Russia is called saving Ukrainian children. Occupation of Ukrainian territory by Russians is called liberation from Nazi regime. Shelling of Ukrainian hospitals, universities, schools, uh, apartment buildings is called <coughs> defending Russia from NATO. Why should Russia try to defend itself from NATO? Until its full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Russia, along with Ukraine and Austria, has been a member of several NATO partnership programs, Partnership for Peace and Euro-Atlantic Partnership Council, the NATO-Russia Permanent Joint Council was established, and Russia was the only country in the world um, which enjoyed this such a special position. Russia was free to join NATO, but had never started the admission process. Uh, as we know, a country can become a NATO member only after it has applied for it. And NATO had never encircled Russia, simply because only 4% of the Russian territory borders on NATO member state. This after Finland joined NATO. In the political debate, the Russian state propaganda has succeeded in establishing the fairy tale uh, of the 
expanding NATO, which is encircling Russia. At the same we decades ago, the uh, Soviet Union called um, prison of nations under Russian supervision had created its image as an anti-imperialistic project which supported the former European colonies in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. This is one of the reasons why these countries um, are very rec reluctant to uh, support Ukraine. They see, uh, they still see Russia opposing the American colonialism, uh, the neo-imperial Europe, imperialistic West, absurd idea, uh, given that the Soviet Union was the largest Im Im empire in the 20th century. And the Russian Federation is still the largest empire in the world, consisting of more than 80 federal subjects and more than 100 nations and ethnic groups. Uh, these uh, were conquered and colonized by Kremlin over time. <coughs> the nations and ethnic groups of the Russian Federation are being oppressed till now, as the protests in Bashkortostan, where Russians are minority, in January this year showed. Why am I telling you all this? To demonstrate that you have to know facts and to understand how they are connected. <coughs> uh, last year, I attended a congress in Vienna dedicated to the issue how to speak with children about war. It was September um, before Hamas attacked uh, Israel. Uh, thus, the Russian-Ukrainian war was the only war in the background. Uh, there were speeches about the First World War, the Second World War, about the interwar period, about war as a phenomenon, but not a single spe a speech about Ukraine or about Russia. But it cannot work this way. Without knowing background and facts, it's unlikely one draws correct conclusion conclusions. In the case of the Russian war against Ukraine, it means ultimately that you will sooner or later unconsciously adopt some Russian narrative. Why? Because the Russian state is deliberately financing disinformation. Uh, that means allegations that they know are wrong. This propaganda is common for totalitarian regimes, but no democracy can allow itself to do it. In this sense, Russia has an information advantage. And just last week, I attended another event under the motto, Peace in Times of War where two speakers and the host were all spreading the propaganda narratives about Ukrainian Nazis, Banderites, aggressive NATO, and so on. Uh, in my comment, I was in the audience, uh, I pointed out historically incorrect statements. The answer uh, was uh, something like, um, you know, I'm not a historian, he's not a historian, we are not too knowledgeable about all these historic things. <laughs> After this peace event uh, in the Actions Radio Wien, it was in Vienna, uh, one participant uh, <laughs> snatched my book <laughs> um, from my hands, uh, I felt attacked, um, and today I received uh, a lawyer letter in which uh, this organization, uh, Actions Radius, promised me a lawsuit in case I don't stop speaking about the incident. I think these people really need to read my book. It is um, intended for um, for people who need a quick but profound and uh, fact-based um, overview. 
Uh, this is a kind of compact uh, encyclopedia um, about various aspects of the war, about history, victims, uh, economical, political consequences, and, 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 and so on. With uh, lots of pictures, um, graphics, color elements, uh, and explanations of terms, it is also very suitable for young people. And uh, that's why uh, uh, Centrum Polis, uh, on behalf of the Austrian Ministry of Education, uh, recommends this book as information material for schools. Um, Wolfgang Müller, thank you very much for your, uh, uh, for your support, for your uh, scientific uh, support for the book. Uh, also, thank you, Ambassador Briggs, uh, for this opportunity to, to speak here. Also, uh, dear Alfred uh, Praus and uh, the president of the uh, ukraine Austrian organization, thank you for your contribution. Um, and also, uh, uh, Sonia Plesel, who is a representative of, of the publisher here, thank you, thank you very much. Mm, you can purchase the book uh, outside after the event, and uh, I invite you uh, to, to, to make a present, uh, a book, like a present uh, for your colleagues and friends and so on, for people uh, who you think may need to read it. Thank you very much. It's very unfortunate that this book is necessary, but it is necessary to have such a book. Uh, let's turn now to the strategic and security aspects of the situation. Um, we invited Walter Fechtinger because he has been around on strategic issues uh, in the uh, defense ministry and in, in defense <coughs> sector in Austria for a long time. Uh, and now he's president of a center for strategic uh, analysis. Uh, and uh, uh, Walter, I would ask you to let us a little bit know what is at stake. Is it the existence of Ukraine? Is it, as Mr. Heger said, is it the free world against the rest? What is happening? I would say what's at stake, it's the international order in general, because what we see now is the return of geopolitics against world order. Because superpowers do not like a world order, and that is what we are seeing when Putin is attacking Ukraine. So a world without order is the first remark, I would say. The second one was already mentioned, it is about narratives. I think we should not underestimate the importance of narratives as a strategic tool. I will explain a little bit in this regard. And the third one is, from my understanding, it all is related to security. Europe is under heavy pressure, but it is stronger than expected. Let me explain a little bit. What do I mean by saying return of geopolitics? Who is responsible for international peace and security? It's the Security Council in the United Nations. Can it do its work? Not at all. If one of the P5, that is Russia, is blocking and paralyzing any decision in the Security Council. So it is a strong attack against the international order, I would say. It's also a strong attack against the pillars and the central elements and principles of the United Nations, except territorial integrity accept sovereignty, and do not breach treaties, like the Budapest Treaty, and so on and so forth. So what we see is a really shifting away from international order, a rules-based international order, to a power-based international order. And that is part of the multipolarity that we are seeing that is gaining room and room, and that is really problematic, especially for countries, for smaller countries, for countries that are not so strong as the big players, and for countries like Ukraine that came, come under attack by a power, neighboring power, that is in favor of attacking. And nobody, nobody can act again. 
So who is stopping Russia in attacking Ukraine? Do we see a strong international unity in blocking, in, in, in stopping Russia? No, I would say. So the first lesson we have to learn is, if you want to prevail, if you want to be safe in the future, you have to be strong. And you have to have strong powers, strong partners. That is the first, I would say, in this regard, what we can learn. The second one is the battle of narratives. It was already mentioned several times, so I will go to the result <coughs> of narratives. What does it mean? Why is it so important to have a convincing argument, narrative <laughs> for the people? Firstly, to have domestic support by your own people. You have to explain what is ongoing outside to the international community. Why do you do it? to gain support. So if you explain the story, you hope to gain support by the different actors. Does it work? Not really. Who is supportive to Ukraine? It's the so-called Western world. Last week I attended a conference in, in New Delhi, the so-called Raisina Dialogue, and it was really impressive you had a division of the world. You have strong supporters of Ukraine, as I said already, the Western world. You have some countries, also bigger ones, like India, who say, okay, we have an understanding that the breaching of international norms is not really a good thing, but we are benefiting from the situation. So why should we act again? And one of the narratives is, and Russia was very successful in that, in spreading it over the whole world is, it is a war of the West against Russia. And it is well heard in the so-called global South. So we cannot expect that the support for Ukraine will be very strong beside the Western world. We have to be aware because at the very first moment, we didn't expect it that way. We thought that the whole world will stand up in order to stop Russia. But it did not happen, and it will not happen in the future. That is my finding in that. So the lesson out of that is we may not stop to argue that it is against international law, and it is in the interest and to the benefit of all, especially smaller countries in the north and in the south, to act against that aggression. <coughs> Otherwise, it can hit you tomorrow. The same can happen to you, to smaller countries, mid-sized countries, in the future, if we do not try to keep up an international order. Brings me to the third point, EU. I think it is commonly known that you, Europe is really under pressure. It started with the financial crisis, then we had the, the, the pandemics, and now we, have, now we have war in Europe. Interestingly, Europe is getting stronger. By saying Europe, I mean EU. EU and NATO countries in Europe. That is my understanding of Europe. So it is a brutal awakening for the European states, but I would say it is really a positive step into the future because now we are aware what can happen. To a certain extent, and for ma many people very disappointing, it is the end of peace dividend. Now we have to invest in security and in hard security. Some people, uh, and I would also say some politicians in Europe, did not recognize or ignore it till now. But it will be the future. Especially when you combine it with the possible situation and development in the United States, where we cannot expect a strong support from the United States in the future. It will not, be, it will not go to zero, not at all. But it will not be as strong as it was in the past. So we are forced to do more for our security. And I add, we can do it. But we have to be aware of the situation. 
the situation in Ukraine and what can happen to other countries in addition. So finally, this, we have a divided world with a strong Western support for Ukraine with a certain understanding, but no support, no support for the sanctions from the rest of the world. Maybe it is part of the rise of the rest. Maybe it can be seen in that context. But we have to see, to look at the realities, and the reality is Europe has to act, and Europe has to act strong, and I would say Europe can act strong if it wants. Thank you for this clear message about how turbulent the times are being at the moment. Uh, let's go to something that normally in this sort of discussions is going first. But on purpose we said it shouldn't go first. But we have to talk about also the military side uh, of this conflict. Uh, and that's why I'm happy that we have uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Christoph Goethe with us. I have to apologize, Markus Reisner, uh, who could not come here, uh, but I'm happy that Christoph Goethe accepted uh, to give us the military situation at, at the moment, uh, on the front lines. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Christoph Goethe uh, has experience not only uh, working uh, in the uh, National Defense Academy, uh, at the moment working for the NATO Partnership for Peace, uh, in the military policy division of the Ministry of Defense, but he was also acting on the ground in Kosovo, uh, in uh, Afghanistan, and in Syria. Uh, so, Colonel Goethe, what is at stake? Thank you very much, Ambassador. So, I will give a short overview on the current situation on the battlefield in Ukraine to get a better understanding how dangerous the situation at the moment is for the Ukraine and uh, also to have an implication of what is uh, at the moment at stake. Um, so Ukraine is, since its failed counteroffensive last year, on the defensive. However, it lacks the means to conduct the eff defensive effectively. It lacks uh, ammunition, first and foremost. It lacks air defense capabilities, but also electronic warfare means and other means. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Ukraine is trying to reconstitute its forces to force generate its uh, offensive capabilities in order to uh, regain occupied territory and to uh, uh, establish, re-establish uh, the sovereignty of its uh, territory. <laughs> uh, in this regard, it is heavily reliant on the uh, Western military support as the Ukraine defense industry is at the moment not uh, able to fulfill the demands of the Ukrainian armed forces and therefore it is highly important that the West uh, supports in this, in this regard. When we look on the Russian side, and uh, Russia is currently, currently has the initiative. It's on the off offensive. It is attacking almost uh, along uh, the whole uh, front line with its main effort in the north in the area of uh, Bakhmut and Avdiivka. And um, from an operational, uh, tactical point of view, um, Russia currently tries to further attrit the Ukrainian armed forces, tries to conquer additional uh, territory, um, tries to exploit uh, potential Ukrainian weaknesses in order to gain step-by-step step as a first goal uh, the region of uh, Donbas. From a strategic perspective, um, you, uh, Russia, sorry, Russia um, aims more or less on two main goals. The first main goal is in regards to, to Ukraine, is to break the will of the Ukrainian government and Ukrainian uh, population to continue its uh, fight against uh, the Russian aggression. This is done in in, um, according to two lines of effort. The first line of effort Russia is using is the uh, strategic bombing and missile campaign against not only critical infrastructure, but also uh, populated areas in Ukraine, and therefore trying to break the will. And the second line of effort is uh, so-called hybrid warfare. We heard that term already before, but just as a small explanation. So hybrid warfare, we understand, is uh, are those measures along all instruments of power which is uh, diplomacy, which is military, which is economy and measures within the information space um, short of war. So what we see is massive disinformation campaigns, narratives we already heard, uh, acts of sabotage, uh, measures um, 
in regards uh, to economic um, sustainability, which aim to break again the will of um, the Ukrainian population and government. And the second strategic aim is um, to destabilize the West, to wage um, hybrid warfare against the Western countries with the ultimate aim to break their resolve in, um, in the support to Ukraine. So what we see, we see massive uh, disinformation campaigns uh, all over Europe. We see that uh, pro-Russian groups are supported. We see a delegitimization of the democratic process uh, within Western countries, which will lead to a delegitimization of the government. All these uh, to further um, increase the shifts and rifts within European societies and therefore the ultimate goal, as I said before, to um, break the resolve to support Ukraine. Russia believes um, uh, the ultimate goal of Russia is the subjugation of Ukraine. And the current situation is that Russia believes it is winning. And um, it is using, therefore, mainly its military instrument of power to uh, reach this goal. That is the current situation, um, as um, dangerous as it is. Thank you. <laughs> Again, very clear words. Thank you for them, although I didn't like to hear them. Um, last but not least, we asked Professor Wolfgang Müller, uh, historian, University of Vienna, professor of, of Russian history, and uh, also uh, much involved in trying to understand where things come from, how narratives develop. And he's been active uh, in the Russian Austrian Historical Commission. He is active in the uh, Austrian Ukrainian Historical Commission. Uh, and uh, as you know, he is very often asked by Austrian television and radio also to, to comment uh, on, uh, well, to look a little bit into the head of Mr. Putin. And you, you always refuse to answer these sort of questions. Uh, so what is at stake? Thank you very much uh, for having me. Uh, I want to, to be very, very brief uh, with regards to answering this question. I want to break it down uh, to the three different levels that, we, that have already been addressed. The first, what's at stake uh, for Ukraine? I believe that has been made abundant, uh, abundantly uh, clear. Uh, also from Russian statements that the Russian president does not believe that Ukraine is a sovereign state or that uh, Ukrainians are a nation. Uh, if you listen to some commentators in Russian TV on the daily news shows, then uh, they even uh, produce doubts uh, whether Ukrainians are people. I mean, what, what you hear and what you can read is a genocide language uh, against the Ukrainian people uh, in Russian state-sponsored media and that is certainly a very dangerous effect and this is something that uh, leaves no doubt uh, what the future of Ukraine as it is envisioned uh, in uh, the current uh, Russian narrative and discourse would be. Uh, with regard to the second uh, target of uh, this Russian aggression which is the West in general, uh, both Ambassadors uh, Krimenevs and, and Briggs have already pointed to the fact that uh, President, uh, that President Putin uh, has uh, also made uh, several statements. No, it should be better, <laughs> I hope. Yeah, uh, has already made several <laughs> statements uh, that uh, Russia sees itself in a war against uh, the West and uh, also uh, Colonel Goethe has uh, given us some details what this war against the West means. It perhaps would not develop as many people would expect it to be, but uh, there is an aggression going on against many Western countries already for some years in the cyberspace. It's going on in the field of narratives. It's going on in or with regard to uh, meddling into uh, political 
uh, processes trying to delegitimize Western liberal democracy, uh, even stimulating migration against Western countries in order to destabilize Western societies. If you think about what's going on uh, at the Russian-Finnish border right now where African and, and Arab migrants are uh, channeled to Western, Western borders or what has happened in, in Poland uh, a year ago uh, where the same happened uh, from the Belarusian order, uh, then you may also think about that this is part of this Western, uh, of this, this Russian uh, hybrid warfare against the West. And uh, also, when we uh, just uh, remember what happened uh, over the past uh, three or four year, uh, four weeks, uh, for instance, four weeks ago, when when uh, German uh, German authorities uh, discovered about fifty thousand uh, social media fake accounts uh, that had been used to stir uh, unrest in Germany or a week later when the French authorities took down 200 websites that had been used for spreading uh, disinformation, or uh, only about a week ago when a so-called wanted list, a Russian wanted list was leaked uh, through various channels with 95,000 names uh, on it that were supposedly wanted uh, by Russia. There is also uh, 13 Austrian citizens among them. I do not know them, uh, neither personally no, nor in any other uh, way, but uh, this is also something that can give us an impression about what uh, hybrid warfare and what this uh, threat against the West means. And lastly, what's at stake with regard uh, to the international order? Uh, here, uh, Mr. Feichlinger was already very clear uh, with uh, the perspective of this uh, thrust against a rule-based international order uh, that's inherent in Russian aggression against Ukraine. But we also uh, perhaps uh, should think about what this war and the repeated nuclear blackmail uh, that's also part of the psychological warfare of Russia against the West uh, means for the issue of nuclear security in the future. Uh, so it's highly likely that uh, this repeated uh, nuclear blackmail is also going to stimulate a new uh, nuclear arms race uh, and uh, the turning or the searching for uh, nuclear for developing nuclear weapons in many countries of the world uh, that are not uh, nuclear uh, weapon states right now. So uh, briefly summarizing, I believe that uh, what's at stake both or, or uh, for all these uh, three levels, for Ukraine, for the West in general, and for a rule-based international system is tremendous. So uh, to cite uh, Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister uh, Heger, uh, and I, I wrote it down, what, what you said uh, is what's at stake is no nothing less than our future. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, the stakes are high. It seems to be the case. Uh, but we, we don't want to leave you with that this, about the stakes. We want to also talk in a short second round about what's ahead. What can our experts on the panel tell us about what they expect and what's possible to do if, if the stakes are as, as high as they are? Uh, and as we are in, in a diplomatic academy, there is also the question, can diplomacy help? We have students also here from the Diplomatic Academy. What can diplomacy do for the way, uh, for the way forward? Uh, so let's ask Eduard Tega first, what's ahead? Well, definitely diplomacy is very much needed and always was very important in the crucial moments of uh, the history of uh, humanity. But uh, what I think, and listening to the, the, to the messages that were shared here today, 
there are several battlefields, and, and we as a developed world definitely can win in most of those battlefields. The first was economy, economic uh, battlefield. We saw, and energy is part of it, we saw how Europe was dependent on Russian oil and gas. And I remember at the beginning of this war, we were discussing, okay, how long it's going to take Europe to diversify from Russian oil and gas. And there was estimates like not sooner than the end of 26, and that's kind of a wish. Now we see how the whole community of Western countries jumped into it, and now we see the diversification as a very strong and very close to kind of level zero. Many countries are already at level zero. And we see that the trick that Putin tried with increasing the price of uh, gas by lowering the storages during the summer of 21, preparing for the war already in his mind, he knew that this is going to be his main uh, income source, raising the price for lower capacity of the, of the gas. So now we see that the prices of the gas are as they were before. So, so we reacted very strongly. Security, we're putting a lot of budgets, uh, a part of a uh, gr great share of our budgets into security. So we'll climb up with the uh, presence of the we weapon systems in Europe. So we will be there again fairly soon, let's say five to seven, maybe, I don't know, a decade. But we are on the, on the way. But I think the battlefield that we are losing, and I don't really know how to start to win unless we put more people uh, into, into action is the information. And as you mentioned, the, the psychological uh, warfare. Because the, the digital world, we somehow weren't ready for such presence of digital world that we are part of. Because if you look at the social platforms, I mean, everybody's on it. We don't even communicate. Even we sit at the restaurant next to each other. Sometimes we text each other without really speaking, right? And and uh, so so it's so present. And we see that Russia was preparing themselves, or Putin was preparing himself much better for this because he's overflowing the the social media with the propaganda, as as you were sharing. And those messages, you go to Slovakia, you hear the same. You go to Austria, you hear the same. You go to United States, you hear the same. So he's very good at sharing it and and uh this is where diplomacy and because you are good with information and uh, but other area we have to understand that we have to develop a new i would say resort uh and that's how to deal with the disinformation in general because it's going to influence other areas as well migration is going to be the topic where it's going to be a lot of disinformation this tool it's going to be for any topic that they choose the populists or the autocrats uh, for f keeping people at fear. And that's, I was just in the United States a couple weeks ago and I spoke to several congressmen and senators and they said that there is two basically emotions that this current dictator is working with and, and that's, that's uh, fear and anger. Fear and anger. So just look at it. I mean, they put you in a corner where you feel fear and anger. And that's why the information is so important that we can somehow start to win on this battlefield of information and we'll be able to overflow with truth and with uh, showing the facts because the facts are on our side. Fear is always just trying to put you in a fog into, uh, into a place where you don't really see what's coming and that's why we can speak you of, or whispering uh, to you of, of fear. So I think... Uh, we have to understand, and I want to encourage you, each one of you, that a lie, if we w wants to become a truth, it must be said 100 times. That's a general kind of uh, uh, quote we, we know. But what it takes for truth to become truth, I think it's the same. It must be said 100 times. It's not enough if you said just one time. So we have to compete with the same volume of truth to compete with the, with the lies that we see and we're facing today. And uh, again, I think it's a new challenge, and we people love challenges, right? We would love to face the challenge and battle for uh, overcoming the challenge. So, so I think unity and really uh, activity is that we have in our hands, and we always, in every crisis that the nation were, when they 
reach the level that they realize they need to be united and they need to be active, then it was basically the beginning of the winning end. And I think we are close of the beginning of a winning end. So we just have to climb up to the unity and, and activity. Thank you. Thank you. you. You told us that it's difficult to overcome this digital warfare, but you ended optimistically, actually, yes. We have to learn it. <laughs> That's good. Uh, Ms. Stavro, what's the head, way ahead? How do you see that we can get out of this situation? As I already uh, put it out, um, well, um, to pay uh, attention to, to the nature of, of Russia, of the Russian Federation, as an empire. And this is the last empire in the world. And what I, what I feel um, uh, that we are witnessing the, uh, 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 some kind of, of the last battle of the dying empire, um, where the pressure inside is so uh, so big that the the the, the, uh, the state the politicians are, are trying to externalize this uh, internal problem the, this uh, internal pressure. So uh, in this form, it is unlikely. Uh, the Russian Federation uh, will uh, last another hundreds of years. So sooner or later, um, it uh, won't be any Russia, Russian Federation at all. And our task should be to, to last longer <laughs> than the Russian Empire. Uh, will last, so it mean uh, it means um, as you already stated, we have to consolidate our um, our energy um, uh, to uh, to fight back um, these these attacks on our world of our democracy of our freedom of our dignity. And here, uh, uh, now I'm speaking not uh, as, as, as a Ukrainian citizen, but uh, as Austrian citizen, as, as, as European. Um, and uh, yeah, we also have to pay close attention to, uh, to the uh, movements inside Russia, inside Russian federations. Um, yeah, um, I don't know. Um, we are going to to celebrate the end of the world uh, or the or the war this year. Um, now, uh, do the Ukrainians uh, think so? So, in Ukraine, uh, you have this understanding that you have to endure in order to to, to see the end of the war, but. Uh, not this year. So, um, yes, we have to be patient, we have to be strong, and we have to be united. Thank you. Thank you. I, I turn to Walter Feichtinger uh, with pleasure, also because uh, he mentioned his, his first statement already, that is a world where alliances are more becoming more important. Uh, and the way ahead, will that be more alliances? What about Austria, for instance? What's ahead? <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> of, of course, alliances. The importance of alliances cannot be underestimated in the future, especially if you have a, a world that is not really united in the United Nations organization, for example. So you have many different organizations, you have different alliances, and as I said at the beginning, if you want to be strong and prevail, you have to, you need partners, and you need alliances where you are a part of, and that is protective for you and for the others that are in that alliance. And 
What does it mean related to the situation we have? I would say four points, only four points out of 100. I had 100. The first one is stay with Ukraine and signal it to Russia. We will stand with Ukraine. In this regard, also avoid pledges you cannot meet in order to avoid disappointments on the Ukrainian side and on other sides also. Be clear in your words and say what you can offer, what you can do, and not more. Second point, foster EU cohesion, as it what was mentioned already before. I think it is a very important point because we are strong today, we will be strong tomorrow if we stand together. And that brings me to the third point is we cannot avoid to build up a military security complex <coughs> industry in Europe. We have to stand on our own feet and that requires the necessary means. And necessary means are also military means and tools and tanks and, and planes and all of that. Because we cannot fully rely on the United States and it is understandable for, from the perspective of Washington why should we protect Europe any longer and they pay their money for social events and so on and so forth. The United States is focusing on Asia. So take over responsibility of your own continent, Europeans, we will stand with you, we will act with you, but we feel not any longer responsible for you. And to, to, to open an, an security umbrella as it was in the past. And the final point in this regard is awareness. I'm convinced if we tell the European people what is at stake, what can be in the future, in a positive way or in a negative way, and what will can happen to European states like Ukraine and neighbors and so on, they will understand. I'm really convinced. But we have to have a clear word and open out speak of all that facts. And the facts are enough, I would say. Look at the facts and figures. You have facts and figures in your book. You can also transfer it to security measures. And we have the facts and figures. And that has to be told to the people, and that requires a strategic communication, including all elements of communication. I miss it already for many, many years, and it is more necessary than ever before to have a clear strategic communication toolbox to explain to the people they will understand and they will support it. Thank you. By the way, we are even still waiting for the Austrian security strategy to be updated by the end of 2023. Um, but I turn now to our military expert. <coughs> What's ahead? That's the most difficult question, I think, f for you. Yes. Uh, so I think um, we will face in Europe um, and uh, in the West four challenges. The first challenge is, is hybrid warfare, as already mentioned. We are facing a hybrid campaign against us, and we have to come up with uh, countermeasures against this. We have to strengthen our resilience and, um, in order to counter these effects. And something we in Austria have, and is called Geistige uh, Landesverteidigung, or cognitive defense, is one of these uh, measures in order to not only counter hybrid threats, but also to uh, reunite the, the will to defend our countries and our our system, our values against uh, aggression. That is, I think, uh, very, po uh, very necessary and important. The next thing is uh, the increase of the European or Western uh, defense industry capability. That is not only necessary to provide uh, Ukraine the support it needs, but also to increase our defense capabilities. And it was already mentioned before, Europe will have to take a greater share on its own security and will have to um, get stronger in order uh, to deter further Russian aggression. We have more or less now a window of opportunity that is, uh, can last years, um, depending on the outcome of the, of the um, war in Ukraine. But we should use this opportunity in order to increase our defense capabilities. The next challenge we will have is uh, within our uh, Euro-Atlantic security uh, architecture, and that is very much dependent on um, the presidential election in the U.S., and the repercussions, the possible repercussions 
um, they will have for Europe. And that leads back to the point where we as Europeans will have to uh, increase our efforts in order to be able to defend ourselves. And uh, the last challenge we'll probably face is the majority of the Russian uh, conventional capability is now uh, contained more or less in Ukraine. That leads or that increases the importance of the strategic deterrence force that uh, Russia has. So Russia is using nuclear signaling in order to coerce, uh, blackmail uh, its, uh, its opposing, uh, the, its opposers. Uh, and uh, we will see this further. Uh, we will also see, or we know, the Russian doctrine um, believes that it can use um, non-strategic nuclear weapons um, in a limited war, and it uh, thinks it can control this. And it also thinks it, is, uh, it w can sustain higher losses than the West. So uh, this topic will increase in its importance, and it is important that the Europeans, but also the European um, Euro-Atlantic Partnership comes up with ways in order to deter the, these uh, nuclear signaling and this nuclear coercion. And that is uh, as unfortunate as it sounds, but that's the challenges we face in the future. So, so my last chance to get an answer to my question about <laughs> diplomacy now goes with you, Professor Müller. Please <laughs> let us know what's ahead. Uh, thank you very much. I have two scenarios, and uh, I believe that from my, st from my first uh, statement is already clear what uh, the first scenario might look like. Uh, so uh, if there is no containment to aggression and uh, no uh, support for sovereign countries defending themselves, then uh, I see that, and I believe that we all agree here, that the challenges uh, for us are going to increase tremendously and that the threats uh, are also going to increase tremendously. Also, when we look at uh, what's happening in Russian society right now with having this war propaganda uh, in the media on a daily basis, uh, with the country being turned into a wartime economy, uh, then we see that there is so much momentum being created. And if there is no corrective to this momentum, uh, then it simply is going to continue uh, in on this path uh, that it has chosen, and this is certainly uh, nothing that uh, we should should uh, wait for uh, or simply uh, remain remain uh, passive about. Uh, so the second scenario uh, is a more optimistic one, and uh, I'm going to come back to, to diplomacy in a minute, but uh, I will also start uh, with the current uh, military situation and then uh, turn to economy and then to diplomacy uh, and uh, then come back to the, to the narratives uh, that uh, we have spoken about already so much. Uh, currently, Ukraine is certainly not provided with the means the country needs for defending itself successfully. For uh, each uh, shell, uh, the Ukrainian armed forces can fire for defending their own country. The Russian armed forces can fire five, six, or seven. And this is on a daily basis. And uh, so we see that uh, the West has not delivered on its promise yet uh, to do what it takes uh, for uh, supporting a country defending its sovereignty. So if the West wants uh, countries to be able to defend their uh, sovereignty, it must increase its deliveries. The West also uh, would be very well advised uh, to close loopholes uh, 
uh, with regard to the economy. Now we have the, the third, uh, the, the thirteenth uh, package of sanctions already. Yet at the same time, we see uh, that uh, there are uh, many many products that uh, should not arrive on the Russian markets, enter the Russian market uh, through other through third countries, and that's also something that uh, is being tackled and also needs to be tackled more successfully uh, than it was uh, the case in the past. Uh, so the third point would be also to use ec uh, the economy wisely. And here is something that can be done also in this country. It was only uh, today that again uh, an appeal has been made uh, to increase this country and neutral countries uh, economies uh, independence uh, from uh, energy deliveries uh, from uh, Russia. Uh, Currently, and up until today, Austria has paid 10 times more for Russian gas uh, than it has made uh, promises uh, for supporting Ukraine. Uh, so that's certainly uh, not only from a political perspective uh, contradictory with the Austrian position, but also economically it doesn't make sense. I mean, since every million of euros that's uh, flowing into Russia is being used for the Russian war effort at the moment, and Austria will have to pay more or less also for uh, <coughs> rebuilding Ukraine. Uh, each euro is being spent twice, once uh, for uh, financing the Russian aggression against Ukraine and secondly uh, for then uh, uh, mending uh, the destruction that has been done by Russian weapons. Uh, that brings me now finally to diplomacy and uh, to the political levers uh, that the Western countries have. Uh, perhaps uh, the French president's uh, initiative uh, uh, the day before to use uh, strategic ambiguity was not very successful uh, because uh, France is a member of uh, uh, not only uh, the European Union and also the North Atlantic Alliance, so uh, one has to coordinate much better uh, to, uh, before, before actually uh, before uh, pub publishing uh, such uh, such uh, statements, uh, but in general, strategic ambiguity is something that the West uh, should uh, use more wisely than it has been done uh, previously. So, uh, had the French president or the U.S. president made a similar statement, uh, not now, but uh, two years before uh, or before the war started, then perhaps the war could have been avoided. Uh, now, it's uh, not the right timing, but in general, strategic ambiguity would be uh, something that can be uh, employed. Uh, also, some of the Western uh, Trump cards uh, in uh, diplomacy, one obviously is EU membership for Ukraine, and the second is also NATO membership for Ukraine. These are the diplomatic Trump cards uh, that uh, the West can use uh, for supporting uh, its own and also the Ukrainian position in a settlement that will be necessary. Uh, there will be a settlement. Uh, there has to be a settlement. This war cannot go on forever. Uh, at the same time, uh, this settlement should be very well uh, prepared, and these are some of the trump cards uh, that the West can use. In the meantime, uh, and here I again uh, want to come back with uh, Prime, Minister, uh, Prime Minister Heger uh, says uh, Western governments must uh, improve their communication. Uh, so keeping together Western societies uh, is highly important at this moment. And in order to achieve this goal, uh, it's, it's crucial to communicate, to communicate, and to communicate. And this is something that, uh, unfortunately, many Western uh, societies have not done very successfully uh, until now. So here is a lot of potential for improvement. 
but uh, in a similar manner as uh, Ukraine has proven uh, many uh, negative predictions wrong, I want to stress that the West also has uh, achieved a lot in proving uh, negative predictions wrong, and so I haven't given up hope that uh, this goal may be achieved successfully. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I know it's late, but there should be a round uh, of questions from the audience before we close. And I know, I see already with the hands, there are a, a lot of them. I, I would like also to invite the students from the academy to ask questions, because it's also a public current issues for those of you. So if there are students here around here, start in the first row. So... Thanks a lot, first of all, for all your different perspectives on this important issue. We've talked a lot about misinformation today, and I think it's one of the most important topics. And as I'm part of a European relationships and international corporations um, club called Club Eric, I have to face this a lot, because also with European Union, there are a lot of easy truths and easy narratives that are simply false, but it's really easy to believe in them, and it's also often more pleasant to believe in them. And so we've talked a lot about this issue, but on a personal level, what can we do to solve this? Because when compared to like having this Russian bots and having like all of this money spent also from Russia to um, spread this information, how can we solve this problem also maybe on a systematic level? Thank you, I, I collect questions. Let's go here, second row. Uh, thank you very much. So first of all, uh, Ms. Uh, Sabro, so do you recognize some, uh, some uh, disinformation in Austria, in Austrian political discourse? And if it is the case, uh, please, uh, please I, I would ask you to uh, tell one example of this information. And the secondary, uh, the question to Mr. Feistinger and Good, uh, what do you think about uh, the uh, European uh, nuclear weapon uh, coined by the uh, German member of European Parliament. And, and, ra and lastly, to uh, Mr. Heger and Mr. Mura, uh, Professor Müller about diplomacy. Uh, do you believe uh, that uh, Ukraine uh, achieved uh, its goals of territorial integrity or withdrawal, uh, withdrawal of the uh, Russian soldiers or reparation uh, through the uh, neg negotiation with uh, Mr. Putin? I know uh, this is a little silly question, but I want to hear uh, your clear statement. Thank you very much. I have in the second row, yes, Mr. Grauchenberg. Uh, from, from a commercial counselor uh, in charge of uh, Danube area. Now, uh, I have uh, listened to, to Professor Müller uh, talking about uh, the gas problem, and in a, as a matter of fact, uh, aren't we uh, having a wrong perception? Because uh, since the beginning of the war, we are helping Ukraine a lot. The government said 220 million. On the other hand, we're importing for, for billions uh, the gas and, and experts like Mr. Reuss, former CEO of, of uh, uh, OMV, and, and also yesterday here in these premises, uh, uh, Walter Boltz, another expert, said we could get out of a contract. The contract is until 2040. It's, it's an infamous contract, I would say, and uh, we will not need uh, these amounts of gas anyhow. But uh, there should be possibilities to get out and... Uh, uh, by that, uh, we, we could achieve uh, more, how to say, uh, that we're more neutral, not in the sense uh, a certain right-wing party means, but uh, in reality. Uh, I just wanted to mention that yesterday, um, Transnistria asked for, for protection from Moldova, and today the, uh, in Moscow it was said that it's a priority. So we are not only talking about Ukraine. This is an example. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, I go over there. Just, uh, yes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Lawrence Cattle from the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy. Uh, so, 
This question probably more goes to uh, President Fechtinger, Colonel Glott, and to Professor Mueller, because you all mentioned uh, about some of the aspects of the conflict. It's not just about political and financial backing for Ukraine. It's also dealing with the logistical and strategic bottlenecks that are happening. Because if you cannot transport stuff to the front line, Ukraine's not going to win. So, and there has been and there have been several bottlenecks. They're not getting the F-16s they require. Long-range artillery and strategic missiles also not coming there, and they need their air defenses to be replenished. So it's also open to the whole panel. What could be done to strengthen the logistical aspects to ensure that the new weapons that Ukraine needs are getting to the front line? Thank you. Thank you. I have Two more questions, if that's right. Yes, please. Thanks a lot. My name is Günter Fellinger from the NATO campaign for Austria. So my question is about uh, the tweet of our Prime Minister, Karl Nehammer, who went to this pro-Ukrainian uh, event now in Paris, and he called for negotiations uh, and help for Brazil and everybody. After two years, where Austria, under his leadership, has not uh, sent any weapons to Ukraine, has rejected the NATO debate, is continuing to buy energy massively from Russia, and has basically done about nothing compared to the necessity of this big crisis. And then here is the tenacity to call for negotiations with the help of Brazil and China. What do you think about this? Because for me, that's a step in the back against Ukraine in the public and its scandalous moment. And there is a last question. Yes. Ingolf Schützmüller, Sechster Lehrgang. Um, regarding the, the question if diplomacy works, I have to tell a little story. I was the United Nations resident coordinator in Afghanistan from 1981 to 1985 during the Russian occupation, or I should say the Soviet occupation. This was also a very interesting period because during these five years we had four Soviet presidents, Brezhnev, Andropov, Chanyenko, and at the end, uh, Gorbachev. Um, I remember I had very good relationship with the uh, Soviet uh, diplomats, as well as with the government, and I had also good relationships, although this was uh, clandestine with the Mujahideen. Now, at the beginning, the Soviet, uh, um, uh, the Soviet diplomats were very hopeful and very uh, confident that this thing will work out. But this changed due to the heroic resistance of the, of the Mujahideen. Ironically, we all know that there was a certain Osama bin Laden who was also behind this. Um, anyway, I was made known in no uncertain terms by the Mujahideen that me representing the United Nations, we should not even try to mediate because they said the only thing which can end this war if the Russians or the Soviet leave our country. Um, things didn't go well for the Soviet Union, as we all know, and in 1984, I got a visit, a very clandestinely visit of the, of the Soviet ambassador, and where he came to me and said, look, this is a big secret, don't tell, anyway. You hear it now. Um, we made a big mistake coming into this country because we cannot win this war. Could the United Nations please help so that we can leave the country at the end, not in the same way as the United States left Vietnam, but with dignity? That's another story now, what happened then with the UN, but I think what I wanted to say here is the only thing which they respected was the resistance, the ironclad resistance of the, of the Mujahideen, which helped finally to get rid of the oppressor. Thank you. Thank you. A last chance for questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, there is one more, and then we, two more, and then we yeah, go to the panel again. 
Um, I want to refer to Mr. Müller. Uh, you said there has to be a settlement. I mean, I want to play a little bit the devil's advocate. Why should Russia go to the table? What do we have? They don't want to, obviously. I think that is rather clear. So do we have anything to, sorry, force them to go to the table? Because otherwise, I don't see how there should be a settlement. Thank you. And the last question over there. Yes, good evening. Sonja Plessel, Theodor Kramer Gesellschaft, where the book from Oksana Stavro has been published. Thank you for this event and the clear words. Thank you, Mr. Heger, former Prime Minister for our neighboring country, that it is also about the future and also about the future of our children. Thank you, Mr. Goethe, that we need a counter-offensive, <laughs> at least in the, against the disinformation. And thank you, Oksana, that you told about your uh, acquaintance from Mariupol, uh, that you told about what happened to you. Because I would like to ask, isn't it also about democracy? I mean, if a man takes away by force the book with the facts from the author, then he, took, he wanted to took away the facts. And if somebody takes away the facts, <coughs> he wants to take away democracy. So when we say we stand with Ukraine and the Theodor Kramer Gesellschaft said it, then of course we have to stand with our offer. And we too, we got uh, uh, the threat of a lawsuit. And um, yeah, it's not only about reading and producing facts, it's also about defending facts. So we have to have this courage. And I want to thank now the IG Autorinnen and Autoren who declared unanimously last weekend in the General Assembly their solidarity with our author, Oksana Stavro. Thank you for that. And a um, question I, um, I would like to ask it, uh, the, the, the audience here, please buy the facts, buy the book of Oksana Stavro, and maybe you could take a photo and put it online at Facebook, for example and say, I support facts. I support Oksana Stavro. Take the hashtag, Oksana Stavro, Theodor Kramer Gesellschaft, Sonja Plessel, and please, please, I implore the Austrian government and the European Commission, please start a campaign for enlightenment. Start a campaign, campaign like Victor Hugo, like Jimmy Carter. Start a campaign against disinformation. We do not, we are not able to fight fabrics, troll fabrics. We have to have a campaign. And we have to shut down the Russian propaganda. And also the collaborators. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, you see that there is already a round of applause for what you said. Uh, I give the last chance now to the panelists to respond to the questions or maybe have a final word. Mr. Higa. Well, thank you. Uh, most of the questions were for the other panelists, so I won't take uh, too much of the time. But uh, I think the diplom diplomacy is crucial because it can build a unity and prepare, uh, prepare the floor for the negotiations. And that's very much needed. I mean, diplomacy must be at work 24-7 these days and use any connections you have because we have to prepare exit scenario, how it was sent, uh, spoken uh, here. Uh, a minute ago for Vladimir Putin. I mean, that's, we have to think of it. And uh, we had this debate, I think, a year ago, or in, yeah, a year ago, uh, there was the summit, uh, and, and there was this discussion we had. The, the, there was the European political um, community first meeting, and among ourselves, the discussion was, okay, what's the, what's the exit for, for Putin? Because the, he must have certain exit on one hand, uh, on the other hand, we have to think of the future of our children and have the message there as well. That, uh, so, so that's why the diplomats and the diplomacy is very important. But I want to say that you know, for the politicians, especially in Western Europe or West European Union, they need to feel the support of their people for the decision. Because it's much more difficult to do a uh, courageous decision if you think of the next elections and you know that you do the decision, but you lose the elections. There's not many people who really want to walk this path. 
uh, that's why we have to we have to work on this that's why the information is very important and definitely we have to support ukraine with much more uh weapons because i mean vladimir putin he listens to the power he listens to the results right now he knows he's got better cards but there is much bigger capacity within the eu countries to help uh, ukraine because we speak of what 1% of, of, of GDP uh, that we help to, to Ukraine, which is still very, very minor. And uh, that's why there needs to be courageous uh, decisions as, okay, uh, Emmanuel Macron started to do some debate, but the diplomacy must help and uh, also prepare and uh, send more uh, weapons to Ukraine so they can defend and they can show that they are starting to regain the, the territory because if that happens, then I think the will for negotiations also on Putin's side will, will, be, will be present. So, so I, I encourage you just uh, to work on this. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to address the, the question about uh, examples of disinformation in, in, in Austrian um, uh, politics. Um, yes, yeah, so the main uh, narratives about uh, aggressive NATO and Nazi and uh, Bandarids were already mentioned. What, but what um, what is uh, very interesting in in uh, in the Austrian pol uh, political debate is the attention to the historical facts. Um, so, uh, to the history, and um, when you are going to discuss with some somebody who who who, who thinks uh, uh, he knows or she knows uh, uh, what is uh, what he or she talking about, you are going to hear about the Kievan Rus, about the Second World War and Vandera, about the uh, Crimea uh, 1944, and so on and so on. This, uh, uh, in Austria, they argue with uh, history or with fake, fake uh, facts, um, fake uh, fairy tales about history. And this is, uh, this is the common... Um, feature with uh, with the uh, russian propaganda um, they all are speaking about history about um, about past so in 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 russia uh, you are not going to uh, uh, to hear about uh, future vision about um, projects about development about new ideas it's uh, uh, all about past and facts and uh, I don't know what, uh, uh, gifts and and uh, and so on and this is the um, uh, big um, uh, so <laughs> the um, um, yes the in 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 Ukraine you have you have the the, the other uh, point of view in Ukraine they are talking about now and about the future and uh, now the point of view of now is also the point of view of the international law and uh, of the uh, rules based order so uh, uh, um, the borders of Ukraine as of 1991 are to be restored, uh, and who cares about uh, 12th century, who cares about 18th century? Um, the rules-based order is uh, something uh, that we should pay attention uh, to, and um, this is uh, this is also uh, the um, answer to the uh, to, to to your question about about fight against uh, disinformation, and I, I agree with Sonia. So um, 
we we need here in Austria, but also in Europe and uh, and in every European uh, country, in every country around the world. But we are talking about Europe, a state financed center uh, f which fights uh, disinformation, uh, and uh, which also fo is focused on, on, on international law, on democracy, on human rights, and our, our vision of the future. And so uh, this is basically what we all need. Thank you. Thank you. Walter Fechtinger, please. Mm -hmm. Just two remarks. The first one on European security and defense policy and whether it needs a nuclear component in addition. If you think European security to the end, you also have to have a component of that. And when I say European security, I mean not a division between EU and NATO, I mean it together. Yeah? The structure for me is not the most important thing. The capacity capabilities are important that Europe has. I'm not in favor of nuclear weapons, to say it very clear, but if you have to have a toolbox like your opponent or your possible opponent in Russia, you have to be aware of that also. The second remark on Austria's behavior, and you cannot expect me to blame Austrian political behavior. I only can say that I think that Austria is still wrapped up in how to say, in neutrality history. Whether it is fit for the future, it is another point. Thank you. Thank you for your diplomatic answer at the end. <laughs> uh, yes, there was a question about military bottlenecks, Mr. Yes. Good. So, um, Discussion on weapon deliveries is always mostly focused on the system itself. So if it's the if F-16, it's the plane. Um, but in order to get a plane in the air, you need a, a surrounding. So we, in the military, speak of capabilities. So a F-16 needs a fighter controller. It needs a weapon system. It needs maintenance. It needs fuel. It needs an air base. It needs a radar radius system. It needs weapons, and so on and so on. So. Uh, at the beginning, with all these weapon deliveries coming on, that was happening very fast, and therefore the challenge for the Ukrainian forces is to get all these logistic requirements, all these sp different spare parts, different types of ammunition, different um, logistical requirements under one umbrella uh, in order to keep these uh, elements uh, working. So there's currently an initiative going on within the UK, uh, sorry, Ukrainian Defense Contact Group, where so-called... Uh, <coughs> sorry, capability clusters are developed. So certain nations um, take the lead within that capability cluster and then develop the capability. So meaning if there's a capability cluster called air defense, then it's not only the system but all the surroundings in order to give Ukraine a package that it can use the way um, it is already done and doesn't have to worry on how to do all the other things in order to get that, get that done. So that is currently in process will take some time, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Professor Müller, please. Yeah, I will be very brief also. I will uh, briefly uh, perhaps uh, compliment or add on to, to uh, what the Colonel just has said. Uh, at least uh, for a non, from a non-military perspective, uh, I believe that uh, many bot bottlenecks were rather political than logistical. And uh, uh, that also had had a bad or a negative impact on timing. So ve very often weapons arrived, uh, finally arrived, not for log logistical reasons, but because the decisions weren't made timely, in Ukraine only at a time when Russia had already prepared itself for this very uh, arrival. It's, it, that's something that uh, uh, perhaps will also happen with regard to the German uh, Taurus uh, 
missile. So when it finally, uh, or when the German government fi or the chancellor finally makes the decision uh, to grant it to Ukraine, uh, then perhaps the Russian armed forces will already uh, be prepared by having created uh, a second, uh, a second uh, a railroad uh, communication uh, between mainland Russia and, and uh, Crimea, uh, so then destroying uh, the catch bridge won't matter anymore uh, as much as it would would do now. Uh, now turning on to uh, or turning over to to, to diplomacy, uh, I, I don't have any any secrets uh, here in my uh, in, in in my pocket that that, that I can uh, now take out and say you know this is this is the, the, the lever uh, the West has. Uh, but if we look at what Russia wants. Uh, then these are, uh, or at least uh, demands, uh, these are basically two things. Uh, one is uh, Ukrainian territory, uh, and the other is uh, the neutralization of Ukraine. And uh, when you look at the Austrian settlement of 1955, then it was made clear to the USSR back then that it could not achieve both goals at the same time. The USSR had to withdraw from Austria for achieving the neutralization of Austria. Or the other way around, if it had not withdrawn, then Western Austria perhaps would have joined NATO. I don't, and this also refers to to your question. I I, I don't believe that that simply uh, <laughs> making making uh, or demanding uh, withdrawal without being backed by by other means, be they military or diplomatic, uh, would lead to any any uh, any satisfactory result. Uh, but perhaps diplomacy can provide something for uh, finding, uh, finding or ultimately coming to a settlement. And very often when we lead a, uh, look at complicated, uh, complicated conflicts, and we also see that settlements take time. I mean, Germany was divided for more than 40 years. Uh, Korea still is divided. Uh, we don't know what's what going to happen uh, uh, within 10 years or 20 years. but. Uh, these are some of the perspectives that we have to keep in mind. Uh, and uh, last point with regard to what can each and everybody do, each of us, uh, to, to fight misinformation. Something has already been said in that regard, and uh, I believe the first and foremost thing is, as uh, uh, Professor Timothy Snyder put it very convincingly, is not to simply sit back and watch how this all unfolds. This is not a brutal football or bloody football game that we can watch uh, without being drawn into it. We are already part of it, of this conflict. So uh, be active and, and try to, to, to fight misinformation. And if uh, you, and uh, that's nothing that we can do all individually, then uh, create political pressure uh, on our, our parliamentarians, on our parties, on our governments, also as like, like uh, Ms. Plessel has said, uh, to provide us with the necessary means uh, to uphold our liberal democratic system to uphold freedom, uh, to uh, defend freedom. That's what it is all about. Uh, as um, Ambassador Briggs uh, uh, mentioned uh, as a friendly, uh, I have been a member of, of two historians' commissions uh, for many, many years. The Russian-Austrian Historians' Commission and the Ukrainian Austrian Historians Commission and uh, unfortunately as a result of the, the Russian war of aggression the Russian Austrian uh, 
Uh, historians Commission now has been suspended for two years, but the Ukrainian committee is still is active. And uh, one of uh, the members uh, of the Ukrainian part of uh, this commission, uh, he's also a university teacher, uh, and uh, he was here uh, in Austria. And uh, he told us his story. Uh, when the war started, uh, he volunteered for territorial defense. Uh, he's some years older than I am. Uh, he has had his 60th birthday uh, only <coughs> last week, and so uh, he uh, w retired uh, from his armed service that he had fulfilled uh, for two years now, voluntarily, from the age of 58 until the age of 60. And uh, I asked him, why did you do this? So why did you volunteer? to fight with only two years ahead before uh, retiring out of age. And uh, he said, I did it because I wanted to prove that we are able to defend our freedom and democracy. And that's something that everybody of us can do. Uh, perhaps not uh, by volunteering uh, <laughs> in, in an armed struggle, but uh, by uh, uh, joining in public debate or also engaging with uh, your elected representatives, with, with parties, with associations, uh, with parliamentarians and uh, convince them that this is necessary. Uh, we are at a very crucial point in history. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to the end of this uh, evening. Uh, I think I do not have to sum up, but two issues came up all the time. First of all, we need long-term commitment, common long-term commitment uh, to support. And secondly, we all need to communicate why we need this commitment and why we are saying what we are saying to the public. And the public is always a diverse issue. So we all have our own publics. So the idea is really to s use the chance of the information also you got tonight to use it also to inf inform other people. That's why we were immediately accepting that this book is presented. It's a good idea. I hope it will also be presented in schools in Austria. Uh, and my final word really is, let's hope that peace will come soon. Thank you very much for coming, coming and give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you.